This is Dr. Bob Greenberg, and this is The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John and Pete. In that thumbless bar Mm -hmm. is someone out there like Glenn Fry, and they're paying attention because he wrote that song, Lion Eyes, sitting in a bar, looking at a girl who's looking at an older man, and he's like, look at her lion eye. And then, boom, this song comes out. So you find that nugget, and, and you turn it into this is the time you know and then also i wanted to say something about bono is he knows his history and he also knows what's going to be history you know dealing with i mean he writes so many songs about yeah. africa and as we we don't have the perspective of history to see this but later on that music will carry on that message of here's remind what us yeah. that we should have probably been paying closer attention right he's not just trying to feed he's doing anti-retroviral things and fine you know debt forgiveness and he doesn't care whether it's president bush president clinton president obama he doesn't care he comes in he uses his bono and he gets answers i feel the same way about bruce springsteen right <laughs> bruce springsteen that was the martini listen the guy's from jersey i'm from jersey you yeah. know he's from neptune asbury park i'm from south jersey which is like do you want to hear did i ever tell you guys my bruce springsteen we well, want to hear it again because it's awesome i did tell you so <laughs> but tell that, it no, I, I, no I, i'm not gonna bother no, i'm not no. sure that we <clears throat> got the bruce springsteen sto- story that you're talking about we got a bruce springsteen no story there's i have only one bruce springsteen but it's story. so good that's how i want people to hear it i only have one bruce springsteen story but anyway back this is someone who uses his bully pulpit, like Woody Guthrie, yeah. uh-huh. a generation before. Mm-hmm. Like, in fact, where folk singers were mm-hmm. back in the 50s and 60s, that's where people like Bono and Bruce Springsteen are today. And yeah. that is, that is their art is all about singing about folks in greatest need. Mm-hmm. Or if not yeah. in greatest need, then, then the salts of the earth that make everything work. Yeah. And, I respect that. My story is very simple, and I'll make it quick. In 1974, uh, I was a sophomore at a very prestigious university, extremely prestigious. It was Princeton. Princeton <laughs> University. Not far from where I grew up, about 40 miles from where I grew up in South Jersey. And um, my younger brother, uh, Steve, uh, was senior class president at our high school back home in Willingboro, New Jersey. Steve. Steve. Doctor, Doctor Steve, Doctor Steve, now a real, a real doctor. doctor. <laughs> he can write a prescription. Yes, Grandma. <laughs> anyway, Doctor Steve tells me um, we hired this amazing band for the prom, and you should hear this band. And here I am, a pre-music major at Princeton. I'm arrogant, fuck. Excuse me. I know you probably have to edit that out, but nope. that's no, no, stains. All right, <laughs> F and A, dude. I'm an arrogant little bastard, and I'm saying, you know, Steve, I don't do prom bands anymore. He goes, no, no, you really should hear these guys. You should come, you should come to the prom. I'll get you a ticket and hear these guys. Sure and I like, I'm just arrogance plus. Well, of course, it was the Bruce Springsteen band. <laughs> of course, <laughs> I talked my way out of hearing them prom. the moment before they became famous. Yeah. Of course I'm the world's biggest dick yeah. because <laughs> only the world's biggest dick would yes. miss an opportunity like that because of sophomore arrogance. Yes. There you have it. Well, what we will say is that your perspective on history is a treasure. However, when you were a sophomore in college, I, had, was I was a dick. It took, you some, <laughs> it took you some time. It takes all of us time. It takes, yeah. you know what? Ain't that the truth? And, and you know, one of the things we talked about in our correspondence uh, before we got together with this show are the losses we've yeah. seen in the fairly oh, recent, oh, you know. Man. Yeah, because this was originally going to be a show kind of focusing on that. And I'm glad we don't because there's so much weight and pain from that. There I, is. But, yeah. but, but here it is. We're at the age now, sadly, me yeah. older than you guys by 10 or 12 years. But, but nevertheless, we're at the age where the second generation of great rockers. Yeah. Is getting old. Right. We're not talking about the first generation. Oh my goodness. Yeah. We're, look at Keith Richards. I mean, he's like, you Chuck know. Chuck Berry. Yeah. yeah. Well, Little those guys are yeah. very old, but even the second generation mm-hmm. and it's a hard life and the opioids 
and the dope. And the road miles. And the road miles. I mean, you know, exactly. You're talking about cat years now. That's right. There's human years and there's rock players' sure. years. That's and, right. And what they go through, they're on the road 250 days a year, and they're in hotel rooms, and they're eating bad food, and they're, you know. You, oh, you, that's strange pussy. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, dude. Well, like, <laughs> that, it's craziness. No, that adds that adds time. Oh, okay. That okay. adds time. But that's... someone like Prince could stay up for days on end. That's a learned trait, and it it's. But but there's also you know chemical yeah. ability to do that. Well, what we learned from Prince was that he went to sleep when he was done being awake, and right. he woke up when he was done being asleep. And at some point, you begin to manipulate those things. Yeah. To your favor, but and obviously your favor you can't isn't necessarily you, what's good for you, right? You can't do that ultimately without without pharmaceutical intervention, right? Yeah, and it killed him. Yeah, and he probably, you know, I still remember reading about Charlie Parker, who died at the age of thirty five, mm. um, and I think it was whenever it was in nineteen fifty five or fifty six. I'm I'm not remembering exactly. The great jazz saxophone player. He was brought to whatever New York hospital he was brought to. And the autopsy was done fairly quickly. And the uh, the coroner, who ever did the autopsy, didn't know who this was. So his age at death was estimated at between 60 and 65. Wow. Because that was how he looked, and that was the condition his body was sure. in. Wow. And he was 35 years old. Holy shit. But he had done so, he had abused himself so. That his age at time of death was between 60 and 65. According Betrayed to, himself by 30 years. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Amy Winehouse, same thing. Yeah. She was never going to get better. No. I wonder if, if uh, and we may cut this up, but I wonder if Sly Stone is still alive because depressants weren't his medicine of choice. Hmm. You know, he uses other things. Because when I think of the dead musicians, it's a depressant. Or, or a combination, but Michael Jackson's dead of, of a depressant. Right. You know, all of these Amy Winehouse yeah. depressant. Yeah. So maybe there's something. Wow. To, not that, that it's. Or maybe, or maybe Sly way. Stone is simply the rock equivalent of my father, who at 91 <laughs> is still Just alive refuses. with no explanation. Right. right. And I love my dad, but my dad, who, as I said before, hasn't exercised since he left the Navy, and he left the Navy in 46. You know, <laughs> he God. Left the Navy when ships were made of wood. <laughs> <laughs> before my dad Correct. was born. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's true. I mean, my, my, my dad was in the, he was wounded in action. He left in the, the Navy when they issued eye patches. Wounded in action in the South <laughs> Pacific. So my dad was a radio guy and they trained him at Texas A&M, shipped him down from New York, trained him at Texas A&M, how to run radar and radio. And the thing he learned at Texas A&M still informed his parenting techniques. <laughs> And that was if something doesn't work, because everything had tubes at the yeah, time, kick right. it. Kick, kick it. it. Yes. If it doesn't work, kick it. <laughs> Yeah. You know, and that, you know, dad, no, don't <laughs> kick your grandchildren, dad. Yeah. It's not going to work. He's got two sons who are doctors. Correct. Correct. <laughs> Just passing that on. Correct. No, no. You know, everybody questions Joe Jackson, too. Yeah. But his kids grew up in Gary, Indiana, yeah. where there wasn't an opportunity to do shit. Mm -mm. And they came to greatness. Yeah. And their most mediocre was, pardon me, Marlon Jackson. Mm -hmm. And I mean this with the greatest respect, because you could pluck Marlon Jackson out of the Jacksons and stick him anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Stick Marlon Jackson in the Gap Band, and he's the best guy there. Right. Yeah. Stick Marlon Jackson in LTD, and he's amazing. But stick Marlon Jackson in the Jacksons, and he's number six out of five. Yeah. Right. Amazing. So amazing. Your dad. God bless him. Maybe maybe he was on to something. Maybe he was on to something. If you don't like it, kick it. There right. you have it. But anyway, back back to the larger issue, and that is it's a really hard life, the yes. life on the road. Yeah. And we romanticize it yep. because it looks beautiful. Yep. You know, there's the woman, the women and the, the substances and the audience uh, adoration. But you know what? Does Do any of us like having to take business trips? Right. Do any of us like having to pack up and go away for four or five days and sit in a hotel room and order room service? No, none of us likes it. Can we imagine having to do it 300 days a year? Mm -hmm. I can't. There's no payback that's right. equal to that. Yeah. And then that constant fear, the constant endless fear that high-end success brings, and that is that you're going to lose and it. it's going to end. Right. That it's going to end. Yeah. Exactly. You know, the fact that these people have more money than God 
should be, to me, a great consolation. But for them... It is just a consolation. For them, it's all about the present fix, the present energy. Do people still love me? Yeah. Do people still want me? I mean, for me, if I had Prince's money, I mean, speaking for myself because I'm a selfish bastard, mm -hmm. it would give me freedom. It would yeah. give me freedom not having to do that stuff. Anything. Anything. However, I could just be a composer. He continued. He continued to torture his body. Yeah. And his, and, and the only way to make his for body work was to take more stuff. And he broke. And yeah. Michael Jackson, same thing. Yeah. They broke. Yeah. It's a terrible object lesson, isn't it? Yep. You know, we, we envy these people, and yet we most of us are so much luckier. It's it's uh, one of the curses of genius uh, like that. I mean, they've got yeah. this. Uh, Tara Kemp, during the episode, talked about he's just, Sly Stone is just this beacon for music, and it doesn't shut off. It yeah. always comes. And uh, on top of anything else you have, you and have it's that. it's a burden. Right, you have this burden. You ha and the channel. only way is to get it out or to yeah. dull it. Yeah. Sometimes both. I yeah, think this right. is, a, but I think this is a problem particularly for rockers. It's not a problem in the classical world because people don't, people don't experience. Wasn't it though? I mean, throughout history, weren't it's, they the rock stars of their time and, and maybe the same curse befall no, them? I, I don't think so. And here's why. It's we, we we like to find equivalency because it allows us to say, oh, Mozart was the rock star of his time, and that's why he died at 35. Chopin was the rock star of his time, that's why he died in his 30s, and blah, blah, blah. But in fact, rock and roll is a media, it's an electronic media phenomenon. The kind of things that we see in the mid to late 20th century, because of the prevalence of electronic media, and I'm not just talking about record players, obviously. I'm talking about radio and television and, and the yeah. movies. Yeah. It's very different. Yeah. The kind of celebrity is very, very different. You know, in Mozart's day... Human beings just aren't built for that. In Mozart's day, if you wanted to play for somebody, you had to be there. Right. Yeah. You know, in, in Liszt's day... And he was the first, if, if you want to say a rock star, okay, List, the pianist, Franz List, might have been the first rock star in, in terms of the number of people he played for and his fame yeah. and the glorification the of List as a person. The right, the adoration. Was alive. But nevertheless, if someone wanted to hear List, they had to go to a List concert. It had right. to be live. Yeah. And there wasn't this, this super, super magnification of personality, this cult of personality yeah. that we've seen in the 20th century that, by the way, has been exploited by a lot of evil people. We're sure. not talking about musicians. Right. The cult of personality that we generated to the media is a uniquely 20th century experience. And it, it sets rock and roll as a medium apart because mm -hmm. rock and roll is the ultimate post-World War II musical medium yeah. and remains so. And I think people become addicted, drunk uh, to the adulation. They can't live for a moment without it. But as we all know, as we age, we change. We're no longer attractive to teenage girls. Not that I ever was particularly attractive to teenage girls. Uh, we no longer necessarily attract the big buck. We're always replaced by someone younger. And I think the most painful thing about getting older, to tell you the truth, if you're an artist, the stuff that would have passed muster in your own mind as you were young, you no longer believe in. Right. We yeah. need to get better. Yes. We need to be different. We need to grow. And in growing, we might grow past the audience that yes. in the past supported us yes. yeah. and gave us sustenance. And I think Prince is a perfect example of that. He had a very sophisticated musician yeah. who can play any instrument, yep. who wrote all kinds of music. With an amazing proficiency. With an amazing proficiency and who arguably was advancing past his audience. Did you think at some point that he didn't buy what he was selling us? I don't know. I, I don't I either. don't know. And I was intimately a fan of his progression during its progression. Mm -hmm. I loved many of the stages of Prince to the point where I think I would have picked up on his inability to buy what he was selling us anymore. And I think that one of the things that he did towards the end of his career, and maybe 
oh, I hate to say these words, but maybe for his musical evolution, he stopped at the right time. Which isn't to say that he died at the right time, but he stopped at the right time. He was, the last tour that brought him to this beautiful city of Oakland was the tour that where he just sat with a piano or a guitar and it was just him. Right. And he would just be absolutely naked with the music, bearing himself in front of everybody. And often what he did, if you watch the clips and a lot of them, thankfully, are available on YouTube, a lot of them included spots where he would be playing the music and the response that the crowd would give him wasn't the response that he was exactly after. And he would stop and he would scowl or he would make his... Because one of the things that he doesn't get enough credit for, I think, was that he was part musical genius and part Charlie Chaplin. He really had a comedic twist to Mm -hmm. his performance that I loved. And... He would stop and he would look at the crowd and go, you guys got to catch up to this. And the crowd would laugh and then they would catch up. And I think it came to that point where he couldn't just come out and do the sensational show anymore. How old are you, John? 40. How old are you? 46. Okay, so you you grew up with Prince and you've yeah. aged, you aged with him. Yep. But he wasn't attracting the 20-year-olds anymore. That's he true. wasn't attracting the 18-year-olds anymore. And I think this is really hard for people that in their youth defined youth culture. You know, the rock, the old rock and roller who can remain vital to an audience other than a nostalgic audience is a difficult one. Who goes to, who goes to Stones concerts? You know, I mean, this guys is, our age and older, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's nostalgia Brandon, now, isn't like it? The Stones? That's a no. It just happens to be that. The Stones can fill no the wait. Oakland no Coliseum wait. with guys our age and older. Yes. Correct. Correct. But that's not cutting edge anymore. No. Right. That's repertoire. You yeah. know what? It's they're, they're repertoire artists, just like someone who sits down and plays Beethoven and Mozart. And those audiences are not looking for new no. Stones music. If Mick and, and Keith want to do new true. stuff. Play the you hits, know, baby. Exactly. Play the hits, baby. It's all, so they've become mm-hmm. repertoire. They're not part of the edge anymore. Now, mm-hmm. some artists can deal with that. Now, luckily, Bono and Springsteen can still be creating new yeah. stuff. And I think that's because of their social responsibility. Their, their sense of who they are within the society and that they're always relevant to today. Yeah. But my goodness, not many people can do that. There, there's nobody that does that. Uh, you talked before on the last show about Beethoven writing music for an instrument that didn't exist yet. This, this part of the piano over right, here. Right, right, right. Bono does the same thing. You know, they push boundaries. They've earned the right to do that with their audience. And like this whole thing with the release where they gave away an album for free. No, they didn't give away for free. Apple bought it for $100 million. There's no rock band in the world that says, no thanks to $100 million. No. And then their catalog. By the way, I would not say that either. No, right. me neither. Yeah. 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 No, anybody who faults them for that doesn't understand. I will also say that if I, if I had $100 million land on my lap, the three of us individuals sitting at this table <laughs> would have a pretty damn good time. <laughs> and Brenna. And the cat. No, not the cat. Not the cat. The cat, the cat can do the one thing we can't do, which is lick his ass. <laughs> And he's completely happy well, with you know his what? life it's as it exists. It's by the fact that I've left the house. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm so glad this is your show and not yeah. mine. <laughs> if you like the show, and you know you do, send us some pictures of your movies. Don't do that. Support the show. There are three ways you can support us. Number one. Go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating in with you. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. We like boobies. But the thing about Bono, the thing about 
Bruce Springsteen is they can put out new albums and people will consume that music because they're consuming because with those artists they know they're that's what they're looking for right and then I would think that Bono and and Bruce would tell the 18 year old version of them keep doing what you're doing but you're going to learn so much more. They're, right. they're infinitely better than they were. Bono can now speak from his own voice and he can bear his soul and know it's going to be okay. Right. But he also can speak from someone else's point of view, which is very rare to do, but speak from the same level of passion. And he can start there. Mm-hmm. That's the difference between him and the 18 year old Bono was the 18 year old Bono was trying to figure himself out. Singing about his mom. Today's Bono can begin there. Yes. And then go on a journey with us. Listen, any, w- yeah. what any 18 year old does, if, if you'll pardon me, and, and, and if anyone is listening to me Here we talking are, about 18 year old olds, I'll tell you about 18 year olds. Someone in my yard. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be right back. I'm having trouble bringing up my phlegm. <laughs> no, well, listen, what does an 18 year old know? But you've got, you, you've got an adult body. No, she's 19. Excuse me. <laughs> she's seasoned. Not 18. Nine, right? Am I right? Correct. So this doesn't apply to you. I was a I was a college teacher for 24 years. I I knew about 18. I remember 18. You have an adult body and a child's mind, yeah. but a child's mind who thinks they're an adult. And that's cool. That's great. We all have to go through that. We yeah. all have to do that. But when you're 18, and this doesn't matter whether we're talking about us or we're talking about Mozart or Beethoven or anyone we love and respect, when you're 18, you are still imitating the stuff that you love and you're still trying to find your own voice and you're still trying to find where you sit within the world. Listen, I'm a great Beatles fan. We're all, I I grew up with the Beatles. I I watched the Beatles. I'm 62. I watched them when they were on Ed Sullivan. It's in fact, that's one of my great memories. And I love listening to the early Beatles stuff, not because it's good, but just because it represents your time, my time, my awareness. Yeah. You listen to the early Beatles stuff, it's naive and stupid and boring and derivative, and it's all Chuck Berry. Right. In fact, at its best, yeah. when it's at its best, it's Chuck Berry. And, and it's, it just wants to hold your hand. Correct. <laughs> For fuck's correct. sake. Correct. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Mr. Postman, yeah. excuse me. Um, right. Um, she was just 89, <laughs> another Frankenstein, and the way she looked was way beyond repair. So, right. right. <laughs> Seriously, I'll never dance with another. Exactly. As I saw her crawling there. So, you know, it's utterly derivative. Mm-hmm. That's what we are when we're 18. We're, we're trying to find a voice. And that's okay, because if, like them, you're 18 or 16 or 14, you're also trying to find your voice. And so you can identify with that artist. Yeah. But when you're 40 or 50 or 60, you can't identify with that artist anymore, unless it's nostalgia and it represents some part of your own youth. You need a grown-up. You need someone who can yeah. speak to you both musically and poetically and who can identify part of your world And do it in such a way that enlightens us. So we're very different as we grow older. And, you know, our knees go and our hair thins and our teeth get rotten and our eyes go. Growing old is not for sissies. But it sucks. It it sucks. But we we do get smarter. Yeah. God bless us. We do get smarter. You know what I don't buy into? And I wish I could. When people say, oh. If someone said you could be 24 again, I'd never do it. I said, you crazy <laughs> bastard. <laughs> what do you mean you wouldn't second. be 24 again? Holy crap. To have everything work? Yeah. Oh, wrong, incorrecto. But I, I understand the sentiment. And the sentiment is what I know and perceive right. and get now is so much more nuanced and profound than anything I knew, understood, or perceived at that age that I couldn't go back. I just want the body. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, certainly, we would all like to go back, have the physical attributes, yeah. correct, and take the the knowledge and the wisdom back with right. us. Right. Right. So, That's why I applaud those who have managed to retain their youth to some degree. Isn't and, that amazing? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? And I'm going to say something to Nile Rogers because uh, I'm a huge fan of Nile Rogers. He's made a huge amount of music that's been impactive to us. But yesterday, he posted a picture on Facebook. Mm. He's on the road. 
and he stopped by his mom's house to do his laundry. And that is a college sophomore thing to do. And I don't know how old Nile Rogers is, but he's probably 60-something. And, uh, and he did it, and it was cute, and it was wonderful. The musicians that advance, that continue to evolve in a way that's relevant to them, at least, where they have the, uh, the financial wherewithal to do those kind of things, they really are, and I'm talking academically, they really are PhDs in what they do because they've either challenged a theory, mm -hmm. cut new ground, or they've expanded on something else. And right. you have to start with Chuck Berry, derivative music, before you can write the weight there's just no other way to do it. You know, the College of Hard Knocks, dude. Right. You know, we, I was an academe for, for a long time. You know, an academe meaning a college professor. Mm -hmm. I haven't been since 2001. You, you know, degrees are wonderful. Where you went to college is wonderful. Where you went to university is great. It becomes meaningless after you're 30. Yeah. Okay. I've always said this and I'll continue to say it. I'm glad I have a high end education. I'm glad I've got my PhD, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't mean squat after a certain age because mm -hmm. no one cares. Yeah. The bottom line is after a certain age, what have you done? Mm -hmm. What have you done since? Yeah, Great. Bullshit. You did this at 22. Yeah. You did this at 30. Well, it's, it's, it opens doors, and of course, sure. if you if you're part of a community, you 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 have friends, and th that community is always there. But the bottom line is, at a certain age, it no longer matters because you've been out for ten or fifteen years. Yeah. What have you done? Yeah, it's just it's an interstate versus a state route. They both go in the same direction. What have you One done? Has more lights and wiggles. And yeah. if you're a great musician. And I don't care whether we're talking about a, a pianist who can play the entire repertoire mm -hmm. or Bono, or Bono, excuse me. Um, no one cares what you did when you were a kid anymore. What are you doing now? Yeah. And how are you doing it? You know, we, I mentioned before that the, the, the rockers tend to suffer a lot more than the others do. It, it, it doesn't mean that the classical musicians, and I hate to use the word classical, right. but I will in this case. It doesn't mean that violinists, the cellists, and the, and the pianists don't travel. Let's say literate musicians. Literate. I love that. John. We got that I love you, man. Yeah, I love right. you, dude. <laughs> well, people who are reproducing the music of others rather than through improvisation and conversation creating their own. Yeah. But who understand that the reproduction of that music isn't just reproduction. Mm -hmm. It's modern it's interpretation. interpretation. Just the way any great actor speaks the lines of Shakespeare right. differently than somebody else. Yes. Correct. The lines are there. It's what allows Lawrence Fishburne to play a different Othello. Correct. But we're also talking about a guy who's got an advanced education. Larry Fishburne? That, that, no, As he's, you. Oh. That, 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 is in, that is in music and can score him some sweet young tale. I'm still waiting, dude. <laughs> but I mentioned Larry Fishburne because that's how he's credited in Apocalypse right, Now, which right. he made when he was like 17 yes. years old. He's still credited as Larry Fishburne in The King of New York. Really? Is he really? Yeah. Wow. Really? Maybe the last credit where he was Larry. But anyway, you don't see the kind of physical drug influenced disintegration yeah uh in the in the in the literate world right. that you do in the rock world right especially historically because the rock world and i think one of the reasons is first of all the nature of the the culture that Media creates accelerated everything i think you're right but the other thing is is that if you're a jazzer if you're a rocker your basic medium is improvisation. Yeah. You're only as good as you are that as night. That performance. Mm. That right performance. There. Yeah. Correct. You can't fall back on anything. Yep. A great pianist. And Never my mind God. what you wrote down on paper. There's nothing more amazing than a great pianist, as far as I'm concerned. But yeah. a great pianist is playing the same rhythm and pitches every night, the mm -hmm. same notes. You've clearly never seen an amazing stripper who can do things with ping pong balls. Anyway. <laughs> but I would like to. And are there videos <laughs> we can watch? Yes. And if there are, forward those links. Forward those links. <laughs> but I think it's, it's a different experience. Sure. Yeah. It's someone who has to live on the edge of experience every night, mm -hmm. right? Which is rock and roll and yeah. jazz. As opposed to someone who's dealing with a repertoire. Yeah. You know, if you're the Doobie Brothers, 
and you're playing your greatest hits right. every time you do a concert, that's much more like the pianist who's playing Beethoven every night. Right. I'm not taking anything away from any of them. I'm no, simply no, no, saying, absolutely. I'm simply saying you've scripted. But hey, Sunday night we're going to do Long Train Running. Correct. You've scripted. Gonna, you've okay. scripted your show. Yeah. You know, it, the people who burn out are the ones who don't script. Right. And and it's a harsh life. So it's a hard life. If we it is. To- I, you know what? I've never really heard it presented like that. It is absolutely difficult on a human being to put those kind of miles on yourself because you don't script it. You go out, and that takes a toll. It's a difference and between Lawrence so Olivier right. and Lenny Bruce. Yeah. Lenny Bruce went out. He did a routine. Yeah. But the routine was different every night. Sure. It had to be different because Lenny Bruce said, I'm being backed up by jazz players right. who are improvisers. And if I don't make them laugh every night because they heard something new, I have I'm failed. Yep. So he wasn't playing to the audience. He was playing to the jazz group sitting behind him. Yeah. If he couldn't crack them up, right. he'd failed. So, again, everything had to be... Is- different brought his every greatness. night yeah. it's what brought his greatness but it's what also demise. helped to put the stress on him the strain on him that brought his demise again i'm not trying to make a blanket and it sounds like i'm making a blanket statement now but i am saying that when you are recreating every night mm-hmm. it's harder than when you're reproducing Every night. Yeah. So if we look at, I believe that. If we look at today's literate musicians, and the evidence shows. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm talking the highest end literate musicians, the people that you two two, right? Two being also the, the guys that play at Branson. One of my buddies plays in a uh, Beatles uh, tribute band in Branson. In the highest level of that, I'm going to estimate. I have no back basis for this, but I'm going to estimate that those folks aren't dying in their bed of an mm. obituate overdose. You know, because they're reproducing, they've got a known value, and for them, they've got this incredible job. They could still go to CVS and not get mobbed. Maybe they might get recognized, but it's not like Joe Walsh going out for a right. shake. You know, I find that amazing. Conductors, who generally speaking are the biggest pricks on the planet, live forever. <laughs> okay, they're, they're working their butts off when they work. They right. are. The buck stops on them. They're running the rehearsals. They're running the shows. But they live forever. Mm. Now, what is that all about? I know there are some composers die young, and many are not bad people, as I just meant to imply. Right. Not really. I mean, a wonderful guy. Um, I I won't name names, but, but some die young. But they don't die on the podium. They're responsibility their job is to recreate a repertoire that already exists Mm -hmm. that's so different from having to sing a new tune every night it's so different i think when you have to sing a new tune every night it's too much i do i think it can destroy you it's too close to the edge it can destroy you aside from what your thought is of that I think that we can point to too many examples where that was absolutely true. Because if you look at Mm -hmm. an artist who was perfectly happy with recreating, and I don't know who, help me out here, Pete. Jackson Brown, maybe? Sure. Versus Prince, who felt the burden of continuing to create. And any of the folks who you would fit and our listeners have two people who fit in that category right. of their own. And But anybody who you fit in that model of, I'm 50 years old and I have to continue to create. And listen, I, I see I see the flaw in my own argument. Because, because at the bottom line is, when you're doing the club scene, the concert scene, the rock scene, drugs and, and all kinds of stimulants and pharmaceuticals are available by nature of the genre. Yes. Uh, to say nothing for alcohol, which we've indulged in ourselves. So I, I understand. We indulged in one. Yes. Martini. It's, it's true. <laughs> but, I'd like two though. <laughs> well, we can do that, but after we're on. But the, but, but having said that, I, I am aware that, that the basic culture of the performing arts tends to intensify the taking of pharmaceuticals. But having said that, why isn't that true in the classical world as well? Right. And was it it's not lesser access 
to to the pharmaceuticals. I mean, would Mozart have been? Uh, Mozart liked his alcohol. I, yeah. I think it's that that walking on the edge thing. You you make your money by being relevant. Relevance is on the edge. That composer that lives to be eighty five years old, he can write all the stuff he wants to write, but he's got a protected audience. He can go out and perform it. He's not putting his entire bet on his relevance. Yeah, a composer does not put his or her relevance down because if you're a composer like me, right, someone who sits down at a drawing table and a piano with my pencils and my music paper and says, I have six months. Right. I'm going to write two pieces. I'm writing this piece for my pianist friend, Roger Woodward. I'm writing this piece for a string quartet named the Alexander Quartet. I'm working by myself without any external pressure. There's internal pressure. There's right. always internal pressure, no matter who we are. But it's peaceful. Yes. And aside from the cat who we invoked moments ago, whose name is Teddy and who's sitting at our feet, yeah. um, I've got no one to bug me. Right. And so I can, and if I have all day, every day, if it doesn't happen from 8 to 11, well, it might happen from noon to 4. Sure. That's, you know what, to me, that's a really beautiful and calm and magnificent life. And if I had that hundred million dollars, mm-hmm. the first thing I do after giving half it away to you guys. Hey, thanks. And no problem. The first thing I do is buy myself the freedom to experience that peace without having to worry about money all the time, sure. which is along with death and taxes, the one thing we all have in freaking common yeah. is worrying about money all the freaking time. So composing for me is actually an incredibly peaceful and meditative act. Therapeutic. Oh, it's so cool and it's yeah. so wonderful. And I'm, I, I get to sit at my piano when I have a wonderful piano. And it's just, ah, oh, I'm, I'm getting all teary and weird now. I want our audience but so, to so know. So composing that... is a beautiful thing. Yeah. But performing publicly yeah. Yeah. is a whole different ball game. Oh, my goodness. Oh, it's a scrutiny that can't be fun if you compare it to the serenity of allowing yourself to be the channel. Correct. Performing publicly is different. And if your audience expects you always to be different and better and to be growing, and if you put this extraordinary pressure on yourself, which is what performing artists have to do, because how do you motivate yourself? I mean, listen, we all motivate ourselves different ways, but self-motivation is the hardest gig on the planet. Mm -hmm. And self-motivation more often than not has to deal with self-loathing and a sense of personal hatred. If I don't do A, I will be B. Right. And if there's a, a traveling band of people, 40 of you, all in seven different buses, there's tumult, there's constant oh, chaos, and that's who. there's oh. ego, and all these oh other God, things. Yes. Where Even if there's just one of you, because the thing about Prince that makes us all so angry who took this journey with him all of our lives is that we would have just loved him. We would have loved him to the end. We would have continued to love and lavish affection upon him. And that wasn't ultimately good enough. You know, we felt all this. I mean, did any of us feel differently when Robin Williams took his own Robin Williams. Then that's the thing about this year. In this past 12 months, it's been so difficult is that all of these people were the ones that we expected to continue to lavish our affection upon for the rest of our lives, never mind theirs. But, you know, between... Our selfish expectations. Right. right, As opposed to their horrific realities. Horrific realities. Which we never understood. No. Robin Williams, with with his disease, was staring the ultimate horror in the face. Here was a intellectual Mm -hmm. and comedic athlete, a genius, who was looking at the worst curse anyone could experience, and that is losing his powers. Yeah. Mediocrity. Utterly beyond mediocrity. Yeah, yeah. His brain was going. Right. Yeah. And that loaded upon the natural tendencies towards depression that he had. Sure. It was too much. Too much. I get it though. Yeah. I, and it's terrible, but I get it. It is Every terrible. day was it going to be his last best day. You know, every day would go down, down, right. down. Right. And you can't, it's hard to understand it, but you have to appreciate that he didn't want to do that. Yeah. And to live a, a remaining life where you had no day to look forward to. And here's the thing. What motivated him in the first place? Yeah. 
what darkness or brilliance in sure. his soul motivated him? Well, we talk Both about those things. Right? We talk about clowns cry being basically tragic characters yeah. Yeah. who weep, who cry through their joy, sure. you know, and that he was a perfect example. We never knew what he went through. Mm-hmm. What made him so brilliant was his own personal pain. What makes so many comedians great, it seems to me, is their yeah, pain. Their pain yeah. And here was a case where his pain lined up with his psyche, his physical yeah. degradation lined up with his psychological issues. Yeah. Well, who can cope with that? Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't. Who among us could stand you know, up? I don't judge. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm simply saying that the sadness, the yeah. grief of losing someone like that or someone like Prince is that we've all been done. We, we would have followed them anywhere. Yeah, that's right. What you Into just the said. the center of the sun. Yeah. Right. So many different right. paths to that same moment, too, because Scott Weiland he didn't die this year, but he died in December of last year. But it was almost a relief to resolve back to the normal. It, you know, he knew he was going to go early. He knew it. He, he knew he was going to die from drugs. There's no way he didn't mm. know that. And that one day on that bus, when he had said he was clean and on all the ag things and then overdosed, it's like, yeah, that's, you know, actually, I'm glad that, I'm not glad that he died. I'm glad that he's not suffering anymore. Right. Because this day was coming for him, and it was just, he wasn't able to do like Robin and pick the day. But that day was fast approaching, no matter what he did. And it's it's tragic in that he had gone so far off of the norm that he wasn't able to have like a Prince thing where we were all shocked, but it was still coming for him no matter what, partly because he had to go out and reinvent all the time and constantly live on the edge. I think the thing that bugs me the most about the Prince thing, and I'll even add Michael Jackson, who I'm not a great Michael Jackson fan, Mm -hmm. but nevertheless, having said that, these are guys who didn't have to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, what was happening to, to the Robin Williams was endemic to his body. Sure. But what happened to these guys? What happened to Jim Morrison? I mean, what what what, what happened to Jimi Hendrix? Uh, what happened to Janis Joplin? I mean, what happened to to Mama Cass Elliot, for God's sake? Sure. It it didn't have to go that way. Right. Um, these were these you know these were voluntary acts based on a perception, but not on a physical necessity. Right. And I think that's the most painful part, is that how do you how do you how do you reach out to people who seem to have everything, yeah. who seem to be kings and queens of our world, and who are the people in most agony? The rest of us are just working people. We just do the best we can. We hack it out, right? We have to hack it out. We've yeah. got kids. We've got families. We've got responsibility. We can't cancel the check just because we want to. How do these extraordinary people in our world take on some of that sense of strength. And I'm not sure there's any answer. I've just, I just have their minds been cooked by their fame. What's put them beyond the pale that hasn't put us beyond the pale. I'm, I'm asking a rhetorical question. Yeah. I don't have an answer. It's a different, it's a different sense of reality. It's a different thing that we can't relate to in our workaday lives. Uh, what I don't want to lose because we've gone pretty far down the rabbit hole yeah. is the fact that we have Dr. Robert Greenberg uh, <laughs> on with us and that he has a series now that explores the reflection of history and music through the ages. And if you've had any revelation in the last hour with us uh, here in Dr. Bob's house, if you've had any revelation at all as I've had, uh, then you ought to take a listen because the courses explore the same sorts of things where we discover parts of ourselves in the music that reflects us. We discover parts of ourselves in the music that reflects our circumstances. And we understand a little better pieces of history through the music that was created uh, while the history was created. Thank you, John. And thank you, Pete. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank so, you. So we've had you for... Well over an hour, as as we typically do yeah, when we that, come to your house and you feed us a martini. <laughs> uh, but let yeah, it continue. Thank you for uh, for giving us a perspective that is so valuable to our lives and to the way that we reflect on the world and to the way that we perceive what's happening to us today. 
uh, through the way that things happen to others. Um, you re- you reflect on history in ways that impact us and ways that challenge us to talk about it and debate about it. And Pete and I spend a lot of time together where we chew the fat about things that have happened to other people hundreds of years ago. And to have that kind of perspective where we can say, well, here's what stimulated them and here's what it stimulated means an awful lot to us. And we hope means an awful lot to our listeners and our listeners should take a listen to the great courses. All of them reach back to all All of them. them. They are awesome. If you ever like, I'd like to get access to classical music, which we'll call it in this case. Dr. Bob is the entryway. He is the, uh, he's the entry drug to more musical enjoyment. I've called you the Neil deGrasse Tyson. Of literate music. I'd like to think that he is the Bob Greenberg of astronomy. <laughs> that's true. And that's true. Because he's frankly younger than he's younger. I am. He's yeah. much younger than right. I am. He kind of bit me. your he kind of bit your shtick. Yeah, yeah. He ate my shtick. And <laughs> uh and I'm gonna leave you guys and so and our audience with something to think about. My dad, as we've talked about him, God bless him, ninety one years old. Three lifetimes. Viral is a young horse, by the way. Anyway, go please. With a with a prescription for Viagra, as right. if he's going to use it. But that's a different story entirely. Three of my dad's lifetimes, okay? So born, die, born, die, born, my dad. Yeah. 91 years, yeah. okay? That's 273 years. Say what? Let's, Two, let's, let's say that. Yeah, that's three guys. Okay, three guys. 273 years. Three lifetimes. Yeah. 273 years ago, it was 1743, Okay. Johann Sebastian, of our Johann Sebastian Bach was alive and well and working on his B minor mass. Uh, Joseph Haydn was 11 years old. Wow. Wolfgang Mozart was not going to be born for another 13 years. And Ludwig van Beethoven was not going to be born for another 27 years. That's just three, three dudes ago. lifetimes ago. Yeah. All of this music, all of this art, all of this history is ours. It belongs to us. It's today. It belongs to us right it's now. It's today, right now. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Tell us how we find you on social media. I know you're not hard to find on Facebook because your presence there is strong, but right. tell us where we can find you. Uh, Robert Greenberg Music dot com on Facebook and everywhere else. Yeah, do yourselves a favor, everybody. Uh, get Take the bait. You'll be fascinated. You'll be enriched. And uh, thank you, man. We My love pleasure. you. We love that you've been on our show three times. You've graced our our show uh, as many times as even our arguably our show's best friend, James Early. You've graced our show that many times. And we uh, always learn something new. We always learn something deep. Yeah. And we really, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.